Hi everyone, welcome back. We're now seeing how do we account for financial assets under the amortized cost approach if the initial transaction that we have entered into is not at market terms, if it is an off market transaction. Because the, in, at initial recognition, I said that the asset is supposed to be recognized at its fair value. All right. Fair value is generally presumed to be equal to the amount of cash paid. For example, I purchased a Reliance bond of 1090 in the previous example. I presumed that 1090 was actually face value and I recognized recognized it at 1090. In the second case as well, I have presumed that the 1 lakh rupees that I gave you as a loan was actually its fair value because I said that the interest rate that I'm charging of 10 percentage is actually equal to the general market interest rate. Now I'm taking an example of an off market transaction where the interest that I'm collecting from you is not equal to the general market transaction rate. Why do these transactions firstly occur? The example that I'm actually taking is the case of a staff advance. A lot of corporates, they have a policy where they actually give concessional rate of interest to the employees. They give loans at concessional rate of interest to their employees. All right. So in my example, I have assumed myself to be a corporate and let's say you are an employee. All right. I am the corporate who's giving you a loan to the, uh, who's giving an, a loan to its employee, you being the employee. I have given a loan or advance of 90,000 rupees on 1st of April, 2021. All right. The interest that I'm charging from you, interest charged from employee. Sorry. Okay. Let us say the interest charged from employee is 10 percentage. Whereas if the employee would have had to go to the bank, the bank would have probably charged him 13 percentage. All right. I am actually giving a loan to you at concessional rate because this is indirectly a perquisite for you to actually work with the organization. Just like how I pay you salary, bonus, leave and cashman, gratuity and so on. Concessional rate of loan is also a benefit for you. You are able to save 3% by working with my organization rather than actually taking a loan from a bank. All right. So this is also technically something similar to a cost that I am bearing because I am implicitly bearing 3% cost while you are implicitly gaining on that 3%. Right. So it is a cost for me. It is an indirect cost for me and it's an indirect revenue for you. All right. The market interest rate is 13 percentage. Tenure is let's say three years. And what I've done is principal, instead of taking a bullet payment, like I took it in the previous class, I am actually taking it as rupees 30,000 being paid every year. All right. I'm presuming that 30,000 is actually being paid every year. The first question is, is this staff advance a financial asset? The answer is it is a financial asset because I have a contractual right to receive cash from through the, in the form of advance. Step number two is, does the BMT1 and CCF test actually, are, are they actually cleared? The CCF test is actually cleared because the, this advance or this financial asset has got the future benefit is in the form of contractual cash flows, which are payments of principal and interest. And the BMT1 test is also passed because I intend to hold the asset right up to its maturity so as to collect its cash flows. All right. So the BMT1 and the CCFT test, both of them are actually cleared. Step three is I am required to recognize on day one the asset at its fair value and fair value, fair value plus transaction cost. There is no transaction cost over here. But I cannot say that the 90,000 is actually the fair value because this is actually an off market transaction. All right. I cannot say that 90,000 is the fair value. 90,000 is the cash that I've paid, but this is not to be regarded as the fair value. I have to now calculate the fair value. I have to now calculate the fair value. So that my steps are actually changing from here. All right. So on initial recognition, I will have to calculate the fair value. Whereas earlier, I presumed that the fair value was actually equal to the amount of cash that I actually paid out. All right. Now to calculate the fair value, fair value is supposed to be calculated or is generally calculated using the discounted cash flow technique. What do we do under discounted cash flow technique? We basically plot future cash flows 
and discount it at the market rate of interest. All right. We plot all the future cash flows and we discount it at the market rate of interest, which in my example happens to be 13 percentage. All right. So what I'm going to do is I am first, I will have to calculate the future cash flows. What are the future cash flows that I'm going to get from the staff advance? I am going to get interest and I am going to get principal. All right. I will be receiving 30,000 principal, 30,000 principal, and 30,000 principal over a period of three years. And I will receive the associated interest on the print on the balance outstanding. All right those future cash flows i will discount those future cash flows and remember when i'm calculating the interest the interest that i'm going to receive is at 10 percentage because that is the contractual rate of interest between me and the employee all right this is the contractual rate of interest of 10 percentage between me and the employee i will discount that at 13 percentage and i will then calculate the present value of it and that present value will be my fair value. And obviously speaking, the fair value is going to be less than 90,000. All right. The fair value is going to be less than 19,000, less than 90,000 because I am discounting it at a higher rate. All right. The rate, the contractual rate is 10 percentage. My discount rate is higher. If the discount rate is higher, the PV has to be obviously lower. Right. So I will be getting a fair value, which is less than 90,000. I'm pausing a moment over here. Let us actually start calculating what the fair value would look like. All right. Over here, what I'm just doing is I'm breaking this between cash flow in cash flow principle and cash flow interest. I did not break it into two rows, two columns earlier because the principal was only being received at the end of the year, right? So that's the and at the end of the tenure. So that's the reason I did not break it earlier. Over here, I'm actually breaking it into two columns. So I gave a loan on 1st of April 2021. I am now not calculating effective interest rate. Earlier, I was calculating effective interest rate where I was plotting my cash outflow plotting my inflows and I was calculating the effective interest rate over here. My intent is to calculate the fair value. All right. My intent is to calculate the fair value. Fair value is going to be the present value of the future cash flows. All right. The value of any asset today is the present value of the future cash flows. So I am not going to take the initial cash outflow, but I will directly start with the future cash flows. So I'm going to have a cash inflow on 2022, 2023 and 2024 on, in, on 31st of March 2022, I will receive the first principal payment of 30,000. I will receive the first principal payment of 30,000. I will also receive interest for that year. If you think of it, I had an opening balance of 90,000. I am going to charge interest from the employee at 10 percentage. I am going to charge interest from the employee at 10 percentage. So I will receive an interest of 9,000 from the employee, which is 90,000 multiplied by the contracted rate of 10 percentage. Therefore, for the first year, I am going to have total cash inflow of 39,000. I have received principal of 30,000. I have received interest on the beginning balance because this principal repayment happened on the last day. I will collect interest for the full year, right? So I will receive interest on the 90,000 multiplied by 10 percentage, which is equal to 9,000 and the total is 39,000. In the second year also, I received a principal of 30,000. My interest for the second year will now be calculated on 60,000. Reason being, I, the, the employee or you have actually repaid 30,000 in the first year. So my outstanding balance of advance is only 60,000. I will be receiving interest only on that 60,000. So my interest that I receive for the second year will be 60,000 multiplied by the contracted rate of interest, which is 10 percentage, which is be equal to 6,000 rupees. And the total cash flow is actually 36,000. Okay, so on I am receiving the second installment of the principal and I'm receiving the interest as well. And this interest of 6,000 is being calculated on the outstanding principal, which is 90 minus the first year repayment of 30,000. 
In the third year, I'm again going to receive the last installment of 30,000. And this time the interest will now be calculated on 30,000. Reason being, I gave an advance of 90,000. You have repaid 60,000 up to the end of the previous year. So at the beginning of the year, I had only 30,000 outstanding. And on that 30,000, I will calculate the contracted rate of interest, which will be equal to 30,000 multiplied by 10%, which is equal to 33. Uh, sorry, 3000 and the total cash flow is actually 33,000. All right. So over here I've plotted the future cash inflows. All right. Uh, when I plot the future cash inflows, interest is not going to be obviously at the market rate. Interest has to be at the contracted rate because what is the cash flow that I, as an, as I, as a corporate, I'm going to receive, I am going to receive 10% from you. I am not going to receive 13 percentage. So when I am plotting the future cash flows, what I'm bothered about is the contracted interest rate only. All right. The market interest rate is irrelevant. The market interest rate and the effective interest rate over here, they are relevant only from an accounting point of view. All right. Just like over here, when I was in the first example, just like how I use the fixed coupon rate of 8% to calculate the cash flows over here. Also, I'm using the contracted 10 percentage rate to actually calculate the cash flows. The market rate or the effective interest rate is only more from an accounting standpoint. The next step is I have plotted the future cash flows. I need to calculate the fair value. And like I mentioned, the fair value is nothing but the present value of these future cash flows. In, the, in Excel, you have got an NPV function equal to X NPV function where you can give the rate. It's asking me for the rate. So I'm putting the rate as 13 percentage. It's asking me next for the values. I'm putting these as values and the corresponding dates. All right. Once I put in this fair value is coming to 96,000. Sorry, one second. So this we have got in 96,694. I've used the XNPV formula. The only problem is this 96,694 is the fair value on the first date, all right? The Excel calculates 96,000. I mean, the Excel calculates the NPV on the first date. So it is not the fair value on 1st of April, 2021. It's the fair value on 31st of March, 2022. Therefore, to discount it further by one year, I'm discount, this is the fair value as at March 2022, I need the fair value as at 1st April 21. So I will discount it further by one period. So what I'm doing is 96,694 divided by 1.13. All right, I'm discounting it further and bringing it to one year ahead. And this is the fair value as at April 21. All right, this is the fair value as at 1st of April 2021 or 31st of March 2021, both of them being the same. Over here, I did not calculate the effective interest rate. Earlier, I plotted the cash flows to calculate the effective interest rate. Over here, I'm plotting the cash flows to calculate the fair value. And like I said earlier, the fair value as at 1st April 2021 obviously has to be less than the amount of 90,000 because my discount rate is higher. My discount rate of 13 percentage is higher. And mathematically, when I discount it into today's terms, it obviously has to be lower. All right. So let's say the fair value is 85,570. This means I have to recognize on day one, the staff advance not at 90,000, but at 85,570 rupees. All right. Although I have paid you 90,000, I am recognizing, uh, uh, I am allowed to recognize a financial asset or an asset by the name of staff advance only to the tune of 85,570 rupees. All right. The question is, I will credit cash by 90,000. I will debit a staff advance account by 85,570. What will happen to that figure? All right. So I have staff advance debit of 90,000. I have two cash being credited by, sorry, I, I'm so sorry. I have two cash being credited by 90,000. I have staff advance being debited by 85,570. The question is, what about the remaining number? The double entry has to tally, right? Now, there can be two scenarios. I'm discuss discussing scenario number one. Let us say, when I gave this loan to the employee, I gave a condition also that he has to 
remain employed with the organization for a period of three years. I have given an additional condition that he has to remain uh, employed with the organization for a period of three years. If there are such conditions, then I will recognize it to something called as prepaid staff cost. All right. The balancing is going to prepaid staff cost. And because this amount of 4,430 is implicitly the cost for the, for the employer and it is the gain to the employee. Like I mentioned earlier, right at the beginning, this concessional interest rate that I'm actually charging from the employee is a cost to the company, just like how salary is a cost, just like how uh, a bonus is a cost. This concessional rate of interest is also a cost to the employer. And this is a cost that the employer is bearing for a period of three years. Therefore, I am going to show it as a prepaid staff cost. And this prepaid staff cost will actually be amortized to the PNL account over a period of three years. All right. It is a cost to the company over a period of three years. Therefore, I'm going to show it as a prepaid asset and I will then debit it to the PNL account in the form of staff expenses over a period of three years. All right. It will be done on an SLM basis, which means 4430 divided by three. I will each year, I will be reducing this asset and I will debiting my PNL account over a period of three years my loan or staff advance will be only 85,570. After this, I will build my step four. I will do my amortization table. All right. I will now build my amortization table for the staff advance account. So prepaid staff cost is obviously, uh, I, I've already told you how it is going to be subsequently accounted for. This is called as initial recognition. And the step number four, what we have been doing was amortization table that is called a subsequent recognition. Like after day one, how do you recognize it? All right. I've told you the uh, subsequent recognition for prepaid staff cost. Let us now look at staff advance subsequent recognition. In the year 31st of March, 2022, I gave out a loan of 90,000, but I will actually show the loan only at 85,570. My ledger balance will actually be debited by staff advance ledger balance will be debited only by 85,570, which is the fair value on the initial recognition date. All right. I will then calculate interest but over here, there is no effective interest rate, right? So I will calculate interest at the market rate. I am not going to calculate interest at the, F I am not going to calculate interest at the contracted rate. I am calculating interest in my accounting terms only at the market rate, all right? So I will recognize 85,570 multiplied by 13 percentage, which was the market rate of interest. So I am recognizing it at the market rate of interest of 11,124. Repayments will be as per contractual terms. Whatever repayments I actually received, uh, they are always obviously as per the contractual terms. I received a payment of 39,000 in the first year. I received a payment of 39,000 in the first year. My closing balance is going to be opening balance, plus the interest minus repayment and my closing balance is 57,694. Why is there a substantial drop? There is a substantial drop because 30,000 worth of principal has also been repaid. All right. Although the interest is out of the total 39,000 payment, I have 30,000 being the principal and therefore you're able to see a significant drop right in year one. All right. Second year, which is 31st of March, 2023, my opening balance will be the closing balance of the previous year. I will again calculate interest at the market rate, which is beginning balance multiplied by 13 percentage. The repayment will be 36,000, which is nothing but the as per contracted terms. And my closing balance this time will be 29,194. All right. I had a beginning balance of 57,694. I am recognizing interest at market rate of 13 percentage, which is 7,500. I have received a payment of 36,000. I do not care whether this repayment is principal or interest. I am actually going to call it as repayment and I am going to reduce my staff advance through using that repayment. All right. And the last year, which is 31st of March, 2024, my OB opening balance is equal to 29,194. The amount of interest that will be at 13%, which is the market rate of interest, and the repayment for the last year will be 33,000. 
again common sense says that at the end of third year when i'm receiving the last principal payment the staff advance account should actually have a zero balance let us check whether this amortization table is ensuring that or not i am having an almost equal a balance equal to zero all right this 11 dollars or 11 rupees can be adjusted against the interest when you recognize it for the last year all right so this amortization table is also ensuring that your staff advance actually goes down to zero at the end of the uh, third year when the entire amount of advance is actually repaid off all right so this is how we are actually accounting for staff advance and prepaid staff cost all right let let me just quickly this is the amortization table of staff advance. Let me also just create that table. Amortization table for prepaid costs, prepaid staff costs. All right. So basically what will happen is in the first year, I will have a prepaid balance of 4430. I will have a prepaid balance of 4430. What I'm going to do is each year I'm going to charge the amount to PNL. All right. So I am going to charge 1447, 1477 to the PNL account. And the closing balance for this will be 4430 less 1477, which is 2954. Same way, this closing balance of last year will become the opening balance. I will again charge 1477 itself to the PNL account. I will again charge 1477 to the PNL. I will be left with 1477. That will become the beginning balance for the third year. Again, I will charge 1477 and I will be left with a prepaid staff cost of zero. What have I done? I've actually recognized that concessional amount of rate as a cost, just like how I recognize salaries, just like how I recognize bonus. This concessional rate of loan has also been charged to my PNL account. All right. Now let us actually see in year one. Imagine your PNL account. Year one. All right. Let me just copy this. In year one, 31st of March, 2022, I recognized interest income of 11,124. I recognized interest income of 11,124 and I recognized an expense of staff cost of 1,477. So my net income that I recognized in the p and account is 9,647 in year one. All right. I had interest income of 11,124. Uh, I had a cost of 1477. The net for income that I recognized is 9647. Similarly, for the second year, I had an income of 7500 and I had an expense of 1477. So, on a net basis, I recognized an income of 6023. In third year, I had an income, interest income of 3795. I had an expense of 1477. So, I recognized a net income of 2318. Over a period of three years, if you actually see, I have recognized interest income of 17,989. I have totally recognized 17,989. If I actually adjust this 11 rupees over here, if I adjust this 11 rupees over here and reduce this by 11, or sorry, I should probably add 11. It becomes zero and the last year slightly goes up and I recognize the total net income of 18,000. In, in each of the years, I recognize interest income and I recognize staff costs and in such a way that the net p that I recognized is 18,000. If you actually think of it, come out of accounting, think of it from a normal business transaction point of view. You gave a loan of 90,000, you received 90,000 at the end of three years. What you received additionally, what were your true income was, is actually the interest income that you received of 9,000, 6,000 and 3,000, all right? You were actually receiving an income of 18,000 in the form of interest in each of these years spread across three years. That is only being recognized in accounting, all right? Your accounting should at the end of the day reflect your business transaction, right? If, if in the real world you're earning a profit of 20, 18,000, you cannot in accounting show any other profit other than 18,000. It has to be 18,000 and it is 18,000 in this case, but 
the accounting is being done to reflect the true substance all right you are recognizing interest at the market rate and you are recognizing a corresponding staff cost because to show the true fact that you are actually incurring a staff cost by giving a concessional loan to the employee it is a cost to the company and therefore it is actually being shown as a cost uh, under the head staff expenses or employee benefit expenses and you recognize interest at the market rate of interest rather than the contracted rate what were we doing under the previous gap what were we doing under normal accounting standards under normal accounting standards we were not calculating 85000 to be the fair value we were actually recognizing the staff advance at 90000 always and we used to recognize interest income of 9000 6000 and 3000 in each of the three years but that was not reflecting the true economic substance of the transaction the true substance of the transaction is that you have given a loan of 85570 and you actually incurred a total cost of 4430 and that is what is actually being reflected under IFRS or NDS 109 all right so this was a case where we were accounting for off market transactions off market transactions being cases where the interest rate the contracted interest rate is not the same as market interest rate in all the other cases otherwise there is a general presumption that the amount of cash paid out is actually equal to the fair value and we do not have to separately calculate the fair value but in such cases we have to calculate the effective interest rate all right where we already know the fair value we calculate the effective interest rate but we are we are no we are give, we are having the market interest rate as a given and we are actually back calculate the fair value and we are then doing the subsequent recognition now a small last 2 minute case i actually presumed that the employee is actually having a condition to stay with the company for a period of 3 years all right if there is no such condition for the employee to stay with the company for a period of 3 years then on day 1 itself you will not be carrying this prepaid staff cost for 3 years on day 1 itself you will show this as a employee benefit expense on day 1 itself you will write it off to your pnl account instead of carrying it for a period of 3 years on day 1 itself you will write it off all right you will take it to the pnl account all right so two cases is one where conditions exist where employment conditions exist then recognize an asset and then amortize it all right if conditions don't exist then on day one itself you charge it off to the pnl account do not carry it as an asset that is how we actually treat off market transactions there can be many other off market transactions for example let us say i am uh, a parent company is giving a loan to a subsidiary company if a parent company gives a loan to a subsidiary company it may be at concessional interest rates all right in such a case obviously it won't be called as prepaid staff cost rather we will use other terminologies the parent will call it as investment in equity of the subsidiary we will treat this 4430 as if the parent has actually invested in the equity of the subsidiary it's technically being looked at as investment in equity and obviously investment in equity will not be written off all right it will not be written off so there can be such off market transactions between intra group companies and it will i mean in case of staff advances we called it as prepaid staff cost in case of where a parent is giving loan to a subsidiary it will be called as investment in equity all right it will be treated as investment in equity where let us say if a subsidiary is giving a loan to the parent if let's say a subsidiary is giving loan to the parent in the books of accounts of subsidiary the subsidiary is giving a loan to the parent so it will treat 85000 as loan to parent cash outflow will be 9000 this 4430 will be treated as a dividend payment all right it will be treated as a dividend payment when parent is giving loan to subsidiary it is being treated as investment in subsidiary when subsidiary is giving a loan to the parent it is being treated as a payment of dividend all right it's being treated as a payment of dividend and please remember i'm looking at i'm uh, discussing financial asset recognition all right so i'm discussing it from the person from the viewpoint of the person who's actually giving the loan all right when the subsidiary is giving the loan i'm talking about how is it accounted in the books of subsidiary and subsidiary is going to treat it as a dividend payment it will be a charge against retained earnings because that is how you actually treat dividends right that is a discussion on off market transactions predominantly staff advances is the key point but otherwise you can also have other transactions like parent subsidiary relationship that's it for this video in the next video we'll see how to we actually account for financial assets at 
fair value through other comprehensive income all right financial assets a fair value through other comprehensive income will be covered in the next class thank you guys